Good morning, church. Good morning. All right. Uh, it is great to be with you guys. I'm seeing more faces come in as the weather has warmed up. I'll tell you what, it's been a cold last couple of Sundays, and uh, uh, hearing 50s and sunny this week, so right, right, there's something to be happy about. Uh, it is great to be here with you guys today. Uh, a half hour ago, I was like, I'm ready to start. Like, I'm just ready to start. So I hope you have come with an expectation of hearing the Word of God and letting the Holy Spirit just get a hold of you this morning, Amen. because that is why we're here, right? Um, now, I have one thing that I would like to talk about right from the jump, right from the get-go. Uh, you guys know that we have an account now with Right Now Media. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to jump on and look at it. There's a lot of great devotions. I use mine weekly. Uh, it is a great time to sit down and hear from great teachers, teachers much better than I, that uh, just pour into you, and it's a way to stay connected in the Word. And so I'd like you to take a look at this video, if you would. One of the hardest things that we ran into as a church, especially being a smaller church plant, is having good discipleship content for the people in our congregation. Um, we had people who were willing to lead small groups and teach classes, uh, but they were overwhelmed by the fact that they would have to create content. And so the greatest challenge that Right Now Media has helped us with is having content that both we can give people throughout the week to pay attention to, as well as content that leaders of small groups can use to engage conversations conversations with people as we disciple new believers. Right now, media, of course, has world-class content from incredible um, Christians across the world. And so we get to learn from leaders uh, who we might love to go to church there, but they don't have a church in the area. And so we get to learn from um, some incredible pastors and communicators. It's hard to quantify that value, but the value that, the, that Right Now Media has brought is a resource that we can put in the hands of every single person who comes into our church. There's a ton of different ways that our church use Right Now Media currently. Uh, one of the primary functions, which honestly, as a pastor, I didn't see it um, becoming this, but it kind of became Netflix for kids uh, for our, our families inside of our church. And so there's incredible biblical-based uh, kids content on there that families can go home and they can rest assured that if they put that on for their children, that their children are going to grow in the kingdom of God rather than, you know, step away from it. Um, I use it primarily as a lead pastor uh, for discipleship. And so, um, for example, the other day we had a day off for our team and, and I went on and found a, a video about rest, a little five minute video. And as a lead pastor, I was able to take powerful training content and put it in front of our team uh, without having to do much other than click a button. And so I really love that because we get the opportunity to grow each week from that study. And I love that it's just bite-sized. There's a ton of information jammed into a small window of time. Um, and we can get back to doing ministry. Um, that's been the primary value. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of money on curriculum before Right Now Media, and now we only spend money on Right Now Media. And so it's been a, a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal resource for our team and for our families. This is a great opportunity for the church. And when the leadership council decided to do this, uh, I was told that you guys had looked at doing this before I came. Uh, and I think it was with uh, Reverend Alan Walker. I think you guys had contemplated doing this. This is great material on here. And so I'd love for you guys to take advantage of it, even at home, if you're not even part of a group, to be able to spend some time with great teaching. And, and whether it's your adult teaching or if you have kids, grandkids, it's a great thing for them to take a look at and ground them in our faith. Um, that's what I've got for you to start with. I'm excited to be worshiping with you guys today. Let's stand as you're able as we start our worship. <coughs>
good one. Good hear you guys. We haven't done that in a while. We haven't done that one but in a while. But it's nice and upbeat. Good one to get started on. You can't go wrong with some Chris Tomlin, right? <laughs> can't go wrong with some Chris Tomlin. All right. We said, take my life. Um, that, that, those words were in there. Um, we're going to continue with that same theme in our next song. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my voice and. Judy liked that one. Judy liked that one? Just so you know, Judy liked that one. It was (laughs) awesome. I love looking out there and seeing who's really getting into certain songs. It makes us us feel good when we know you like certain things. Yes, for sure. (laughs) But don't cry. That's really hard because then I want to cry. But if it moves you, you, yes, for sure. But that that is hard to look out there and, and see the emotion sometimes. And I'm like, keep it together, keep it together. So, all right. We are um, somehow, remember when we did all the birthdays a couple weeks ago? And Pastor, I think, left out, uh, bless you, (laughs) left out a little bit of information off of that sheet that he just had an anniversary, him and Kay. So, (laughs) we're going, yeah, 16, right? Yes, okay. All right, let's sing to them. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary. God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. You're not going to get that past us. No way. All right. No. Happy anniversary for sure. All right. Everybody take them. Oh, wait. One more. Miss Marty, tomorrow. Tomorrow is Marty's birthday. Yes, yes. We, we think we mentioned it earlier, but we, we wanted to mention it again because it's yes. literally tomorrow. We, we did so. sing to her already, but yes, if everybody could give Marty a little love tomorrow, that would be great. All right, now greet each other in the love of Christ. I'm straining to see if I recognize. Oh, we, we are. I 
just hope back in the day before you were conscious of this that it wasn't R rated. So what do, we, what do we do with this thing? Are we just singing it a cappella uh, on four? No, I, I never, never have learned. Never. Good morning. <laughs> well, I know it's too low. That's for sure. D's. D. Low. Let's find our C's. Good morning. Good, morning. Good morning. I am sat there with these are your announcements. Thank you for your generosity and provided items for Pastor Steve's homeless ministry at Mardi Gras. It's greatly, greatly appreciated. We will begin our all church book study soon. Please take a look at the sign up table and to participate in the group in a group. Please take some authentication. Authentic invitation, invitation cards to give to those who you would like to invite to church and invite everyone, not just your friends. Enjoy your worship. Okay, Bethany boys and girls, you want to come up? Look, I'm going to have you sit, sit on the top step. I'm going to face you today, okay? I'm going to face you today, so can you sit next to Luca? You're ready for Valentine's Day. Look at that. I don't know. If seven in the house? <laughs> there she is. She's in the house. Okay. All right. I brought something with me today. Let me open my Bible though before I get started, so I'm there. You recognize this? What is this? Yeah, it's a TV remote. You know, most of us in this generation, we didn't have one of these because we had to get up off the couch and go change the channel or volume. They know what I'm talking about. But these are awesome. They do everything for you on your TV. So we're going to play a little game today. I'm going to point this remote at you and click it and tell you what I'm doing. And then I want you to act out what you think it might be. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Power on. Okay, change channels, click, 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 change channels, maybe we're rotating through those, okay, all right, how about this, volume up, how about volume down, okay, now there's mute, I'm kind of leading you on, I don't know if you can think about it, what about rewind, rewind, I kind of like that one. This kind of a loopy thing. Yeah, when you're watching it in a rewind. All right. And what about fast forward? Okay, I like it. <laughs> okay, and there's one more you may not even think about. Closed caption. You know when the words go across the screen? It's called closed caption. Isn't that cool? How would you act that out? <laughs> Good deal. All right, you guys did a great job, so I'm going to power you down. Okay, power off. So, in Mark, the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28, there is a time that Jesus is in control of everything around him. He's in the synagogue in Capernaum. He's teaching, and he's teaching with authority. And there's someone there. It's a man that is possessed by an evil spirit. And this is what he says as Jesus came near him. He said, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come de to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus said this, and he said it sternly, Be quiet. Come out of him. And immediately, that evil, impure spirit left the man. 
What control? Jesus controlled that. He controlled that man's life, and he changed his life for the better, didn't he? He certainly did. And the people that were there in the synagogue watching, they were amazed. Who is this? He speaks with such authority. And from that day, word of Jesus' teachings went all across the region. So this is something we need to think about. Jesus' Jesus's control in our lives. I think he'd probably like to control maybe what some of the plans are that we make, even though, you know, the best laid plans. Maybe he can control what we say or how we do things and how we interact with other people. So let's think about that. Let's let Jesus control our lives and let him right into our hearts, okay, as we love him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we ask for your blessings upon these children and that they open their hearts to let you take control of their lives in everything they do. We ask this all in your name. Amen. No remote controls. Uh, living on a farm, and anytime you needed to change the channel, you got up, you walked over to the TV, and you flipped the thing. And sometimes, how many had tin foil on the, the rabbit ears, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Those were the good old days, supposedly. Supposedly. Um, it is, uh, that was a great reminder of Jesus and his control over things in our lives. But here's the deal. Jesus has given us a choice to allow him to control our lives, right? That's the beautiful thing about free will. Um, because those who choose to give over control are showing their love for Jesus. And then Jesus will enter our lives, and if we allow him to, he will order our lives for us. So there's a lot of decision-making that we have to make. In fact, last night we went to uh, our kids' school and they were having a special art exhibit, uh, written word, uh, drawings, things of that nature. One of the things that I heard was that every day the average human being makes 35,000 decisions. Every day, 35,000 decisions. So the question becomes, what will we make decisions for or against today? You've already made a great decision, and that's to be here, whether you're worshiping online with us or here in person. That is a great decision. But we have decisions that we face every single day. And how we make those decisions determines our end result, doesn't it? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. I thank you for my brothers and sisters who are here. I thank you for the word that you have presented us, uh, the word that we are going to hear soon. I'm thankful for all of the things, all of the blessings that we have in our lives from, from our praise team to our audiovisual team to uh, our, our greeters and just everybody who's involved in this church, Lord. But I'm also reminded that this is not our church. This is your church. And so we pray this morning that everything that we do here is pleasing unto you. That you smile as you look at us and feel our hearts warmed to you. And as we worship, Lord, bless us. Bless our families. We thank you and praise you in your son Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Okay, will y'all please stand? We're going to sing again. You're going to need to put on your best singing voices for this one, okay?
never expected water to explode like that. Stay. I am fighting this stuff that's in my lungs today, so <clears throat> the Lord give me the strength to, to find the words. It's, it's there, but it's hard. Um, let me ask you something. What do you see? Whatever, whenever you go into some place new, what do you see? What you see is what is meant to be seen. What you see is what is important to those that occupy the space that you're in. If you look at the shelves in a grocery store and, and you walk down an aisle, you notice all those things that are generally at, at uh, kind of your eyesight level, right? Did you know that merchandisers pay extra for those particular shelves so that you see what they want you to see? Every church that I have ever been a part of, that I have ever either worshipped in or led as a pastor the very first thing that I look at when I walk into the sanctuary, can anybody guess it? The Lord's table. The Lord's table. It's the very first thing that I see when I walk into a sanctuary. And I look at everything. But the very first thing that I see is the Lord's table. And I remember the churches that I've served seems like a long time ago that most of the churches had their Lord's tables pushed up against the back wall, almost as if it was an afterthought, as if it was a piece of furniture that just existed in that space. It wasn't really meant to be seen. It wasn't really meant to be encountered. And one of the things that I did as a pastor of those churches is I said, Here's the deal, guys. We have got to move the Lord's table up to where it's in a place of prominence, where it's in a place where people see the Lord's table, that they know that the first, first and foremost, what we choose to see and what we encounter and what we want to be part of is the Lord. A couple of the churches that I have served, after I've left, those Lord, the Lord's table has been moved back to the places that they had been at before. And it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. The problem sometimes with seeing is that we have a tendency to judge based on what we see. There are many churches that are beautiful monuments to religion. We see these buildings and we think, wow! What a wonderful church of Jesus Christ. Lots of folks walk into these spaces and they hear someone preach every Sunday. And yet I stand before you today and argue that many of those places are no more a church dedicated to the teachings of Jesus Christ than are the buildings where you might purchase your favorite adult beverage. Let that sink in for just a moment. There are a lot of churches where the message and teachings of Jesus Christ are not first and foremost in the lives of the people that go there. They might be seeking that, but it's not something that they receive. 
When I started here at Bethany, I remember the meeting that we had with the pastor's search committee. And I remember the first night when you guys showed me the sanctuary. We walked in through those back doors. I think the lights were already on in here. But as soon as I walked through those doors, what did I see? I saw the Lord's table right here. Aside from the seats, it's the first thing that you encounter when you walk in this space. And for me, that told me something about you. It told me something about this church. And it's what helped me and Kay to make the decision to serve here as your pastor. The determination would have been much more difficult had we walked into this space and this table were back against the wall somewhere. And you'll notice our Lord's table. What do you notice about it compared to other tables you might have seen? It's simple, isn't it? It's got candles on it. Candles take us back to the day when we didn't have electricity, when the reading of the Word literally was done by candlelight in churches. And we have a Bible. And we have the pyramid color to tell us what season we're in. But that's it. That's all that's on this table. That's all that we see. And I see other churches that have all these decorations and it feels like it's not a Lord's table. It looks like something, it was a piece of furniture that was meant to be decorated. And it's not, my friends. What we see here is a devotion to Jesus Christ and his teachings. And as long as I'm your pastor here, that's the way it will always be. I want to show you some pictures and ask you afterwards what you see. What do you see when you get a glimpse of those pictures? Children with hope. hope. Why do they have that hope, Gary? What? You see poverty, extreme poverty. Anything else? Children. Children. Do you see the church? Do you see the church in any of these pictures? Because the church is in every one of those pictures. You see, these pictures were taken in the slums of Nairobi, Kenya. The poorest of the poor. And these children and these places are all served by a dear friend of mine, Davies Musiga. He's been pastoring the Haruma Tent of Prayer, now Global Methodist Church, for some time. I think about 12 years. He serves the poorest of the poor. And some of the pictures you didn't see are the pictures during the time of COVID when people in the slums didn't have clean water to drink. They had none. And Davies Church, which has no money to speak of, provided through outreach of other churches clean water to the people of the slums in that area. They teach 230 children with money they receive from donations because they can't afford it, but they've got the will and they see the need. They are the church. Their church is corrugated tin, small room, half the size of this sanctuary, probably a little less than half the size of the sanctuary. But did you see the picture where they had their hands up and they were praising God? That's where their hope comes from, Gary. The the children have hope Because what they receive is the message of Jesus Christ. You see, church, what constitutes a church is not its appearance, but what takes place within and without. 
within the walls of the church and within the hearts of those who come. And without, without the walls of the church, out there in our communities, around the country and throughout the world. If you give me five minutes at any church, I can guarantee you I can tell you what the number one most important thing is to the people of that church based on what I see. And it's not always Jesus Christ. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew beginning in the 19th chapter, the 16th verse. I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of God's holy word. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. Also, you shall love your neighbors as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. We've been talking the last few weeks about igniting the Holy Spirit. And honestly, igniting the Holy Spirit is both easy and difficult. It's easy because the Holy Spirit is like a keg of dynamite sitting right here in the middle of our sanctuary. The smallest spark can ignite it. But it's difficult because the smallest spark is often found only when we sacrifice. When we sacrifice our possessions. When we sacrifice our time. And sometimes when we sacrifice our very lives. In our scripture reading today, we hear the story of a rich young man. As we have seen over the past few weeks, a theme continues to pop up. And it's the question I think we have all answered, but that we continue to ask sometimes. What good deed must I do to have eternal life? You see, I think there are a lot of folks who have a misconception about what it takes to receive eternal life. Gary sent me a note uh, just last night, and I want to share it with you because I think it is relevant to this sermon today. And it says, people aren't afraid of the wrath of God anymore because preachers are out there telling people that God loves them unconditionally. Let me read that again. People aren't afraid of the wrath of God anymore because preachers are out there telling people that God loves them unconditionally. What I want to share with you today is that God does love you unconditionally. God loves you how you come to Him. But here's the deal, my friends. God loves you so much that He's unwilling to leave you as you are. Because all of us, self-included, are messed up human beings. We have committed sins in our lives. We have done things that only one person could pay the price for, and that person is Jesus Christ. I can't pay for the sins I've committed in my lives. There's no way I could do that. But my sins require 
My sins require payment. There's got to be some level of punishment. And the same is for each of us. We are all required to do something. One of those things is to love Christ, to accept Him as our Lord and Savior, to accept what He has done to pay the price that we could not pay. And so there are people who are led astray because they're simply told that God loves them unconditionally. That's it. Throw your hands up. Touch down. Go back to doing what you were doing before. I'm here to tell you that there is something that is required of us. Some of that involves things that we've already talked about in church. What good deed must I do to have eternal life? So we know the stories, church, but do we know the stories? Jesus' response is an easy one. Keep the commandments. I'd ask for a show of hands, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to put you on the spot. But my assumption is most of us keep most of the commandments. Because there's some pretty easy ones to keep, right? There's some easy ones to keep. And so Jesus' response was easy. Just keep the commandments. But then the difficult rears its head when the rich man affirms that he's done all that. I've kept the commandments. What else must I do? And Jesus cuts to the heart of the matter. You see, Jesus knew there was something that had gotten in the way of this man and his relationship with God. Stuff. Money. Stuff. And with that in mind, let's take a look at our life points today. Where scripture and our everyday lives intersect. Life point number one. Eternal life is a gift. It is. It is a gift. It's something that we have been given without any real cost to us. And this is perhaps one of the greatest points of confusion for Christians. If eternal life is a gift, why is it that we are told we have to do stuff? Today the rich man says, hey, I've done, I've completed, I've been actively working on all the commandments. His question is a fair one. Even though we proclaim that eternal life is a gift, we did nothing to earn it. Jesus went willingly to the, to the cross to pay our sin price. What must I do to have eternal life? Jesus' response was to do all the commandments. And sell all your possessions. In other words, hear what I'm telling you to do and do what I say. Hear the word and do the word. Yes. We've got to hear the word of God and do the word of God if we truly love Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you love me, you will obey my commandments. If you love me, you will do these things. So does that mean eternal life is not a gift after all? It is a gift. But what we must remember is that when we accept the gift of Christ, which he paid for, it creates in us a desire to do everything he has instructed us to do. You see, when we accept Jesus Christ, it makes us a new creation. It creates something in us that has a desire to do what Christ has instructed us to do. Our spirits are aligned with Christ's. And as Christ did the will of the Father, so too will we desire to do the will of the Father. Eternal life is a gift. 
But our love for Jesus Christ sparks the desire to do the things that we are instructed to do. What does that look like? Well, start with the Ten Commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. And please, 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 don't sit here on a Sunday morning contemplating the whole murder thing. <laughs> where, where do I go now? <laughs> These are big no-nos, aren't they? These are big no-nos in the Ten Commandments. And they're pretty easy to follow for most of us. But for us, today, we've got to go further. That whole loving your neighbor as yourself thing, even when it means doing something for someone that's not like us, we get to do things for others. It's not that we have to, but we get to. We have an opportunity to serve Jesus Christ doing the things he commanded to. And, and yeah, they're commands. But my friends, when you have crossed over that threshold, they should become a desire, not a response to a command. Life point number two. The law and our hearts cannot be divorced. So what was the real problem with the rich man? I mean, he had followed the law to a T, right? He'd done everything that was required of him, of him through the Ten Commandments. In fact, I'd argue he'd probably fulfilled all the Mosaic laws. He had crossed his T's. He dotted his I's. He, he pulled out the Torah, and made sure he was checkmarking all of the things that was required of him. He'd done everything by the book. The problem was, and is today, that he tried to divorce his heart from the law. We can get very legalistic in our following the letter of the law, and even be legalistic in following denominational regulations. You guys know what I'm talking about, don't you? For example, I've been involved with pastors who say all the right things, but when it comes to doing the things even they say are the right things to do, they can't do them. Why? Because the letter of the law, their denominational regulations, prevent them from doing the right thing. Even they admit to these, these things being the right thing to do, but they say, I can't because my faith tradition doesn't allow me to. And when it comes to worshiping God, when it comes to spending our time in an ecumenical service with Christians coming together from across all the faith traditions and worshiping Jesus, and for a pastor to tell me they can't join in on that, because their regulations prevent it, it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. The rich man's heart, like many Christians' hearts, is divorced from the law. We follow the letter of the law, every jot and tittle. But when it comes to following the heart of God, we fall short. And it creates separation between us and our Creator. The rich man's failure was that while he had followed the law, he loved money more than he loved God. He loved his stuff more than he loved God. What we must do, church, is follow the letter and intent of the law. What is it that's keeping you from fully entering into the love of God? What's holding you back? What's holding us back? If it's money, get into the habit of donating more money to the work of the kingdom. Get rid of some of that. Now, I'm not proposing what Jesus proposed to this rich young man, which was to sell all your stuff. 
One of these days I'll share a story that was told me by Fred Bishop, Shane Bishop's dad, about when he heard Jesus saying, get rid of all your stuff and follow me. This scripture, he literally sold all of his stuff to follow Jesus. And then he realized that was not what Jesus was asking him to do. <laughs> you remember the story, Kay? Yeah. That's a story in depth for another time. If what's holding you back is time, you'd rather be golfing or watching football on Sunday morning rather than coming to church, well, guess what you'll have to give up? And it's not church. Satan knows what your desires are. And he's really good about whispering in your ear. Hey, you can skip church. You can give less. You can do less. Nobody will notice. Do not allow anything to come between you and God. Life point number three. This is the hit it out of the park life point. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. As Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, one of the things he shared involved all the worries that people had. And we've got our fair share of worries, don't we? There's stuff that concerns us. Good health. You know, jobs, school, money. We worry about our clothes, what food we'll eat, and even beating the Baptists out of church on Sunday so we can get to our favorite restaurant first. We worry about everything. We worry about everything. I'm not, again, not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'm assuming a, a lot of you came in worried about something this morning before you stepped foot into church. And I'm not saying that I don't, but you know what, I, what, what goes through my mind as I'm getting ready to come to church is excitement. I'm excited to be here. At 8 or 9.30 this morning, and I don't know who I mentioned it to, but it's like, I'm ready to start worshiping. I'm ready. Let's do this. Can we move the clocks and just call it 10? Why do we worry so much when we follow a risen Savior God who created the entire universe is our creator, God. And he speaks with us. And he's part of our lives. And he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us in our hearts. Why are we worried so much? I'm not saying we should walk around like we're in this lethargic, dumbfounded state, right? That we don't recognize what's going on around us. But let's not let things worry us to the point where we can't function the way God has called us to function as his children. Why do we worry so much? It's because we fail to seek first the kingdom of God. Instead, we've got to ask ourselves the question, and yes, it's overused, and old, like me, WWJD. You guys know what it means? What would Jesus do? How long has that been around? Since like the 80s? I mean, it's been, and I, 70s. And, and I hate to think of 70s and 80s being like a long time ago, because that makes me feel really older. Well, there we go. There we go. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for building me up right there. What would Jesus do? Jesus spent time healing others physically and emotionally. Jesus spent time teaching about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus provided food for the hungry. So how can we do any less, church? How can we do any less when we look at our own portfolios, when we look at our finances, the homes we live in, the fact that we get to come to church here? The fact that we get to stream this message out to all of you who are watching online. And hello again. It is great to be here with you. The fact of the matter is, church, we are the 1% wealthiest people in the entire world. 
right here. 1%, 99% of the world lives in more poverty than we've ever seen before. Folks like Pastor Davies Church, where they have to have water shipped in that the church somehow receives funding to pay for so people in the slums can drink water. They don't have to scoop it out of a dirty stream that you don't know who's used for what. We are the 1% wealthiest people on this planet. Not just us, but others like us. If we aren't seeking first the kingdom of heaven, we are seeking the realm of Satan. We only have two options in the conflict between heaven and hell. We can't choose to sit on the sidelines or on the fence post. We can't say, I'm not going to choose either one of them. If we fail to choose God, to seek first the kingdom of God, then by default, we choose the adversary. Each and every day, we must behave in a way that answers the question, how would I act if Jesus was standing next to me? What would I do if Jesus was right here? We've got to answer that question. Each and every day, we have to answer that question. If we're driving in a car and someone cuts us off in traffic... Do we show them we think they're number one, but we don't use this finger? Yes. It's not easy, my friends. And I don't always get it right. I hope none of you thought I was perfect, because I'm going to break your hearts today. But I'm not. But I'd like to think that I've become more like Christ over the years. Do people do dumb stuff? Yeah. Again, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. So choose not to do dumb stuff. Remember the 35,000 choices that we make, the decisions we make every day? Don't let them be dumb stuff. Don't let them be dumb stuff. Seek first the kingdom of God. So how does this scripture that talks about our love for money, help us to ignite the Holy Spirit. My favorite contemporary theologian is Thomas Oden. Anybody familiar with his works? Tom Oden? Oh, we've got to get you guys doing some reading. Kay knows him probably because of my talk at home. Tom died in 2016, but he wrote a book that is second, only, second in my reading only to the Bible. He wrote a book called Classic Christianity, A Systematic Theology. You see, at one time, Tom was an atheist, did not believe in God, and then God got a hold of him. And he wrote this fabulous book that talks about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the church, everything that we think about, especially when we're here. While discussing the church, Tom said, quote, As the soul enlivens the body, so the spirit enlivens the church. This is why there is a sense of personal presence pervading the vitality of this worshiping community, constantly beheld through their actions, liturgy, seasons, and celebrations. Baptism is a personal act of identifying with the death and resurrection of another, Christ. The Eucharist or Holy Communion is a personal act of receiving the bread of life with other living persons as an act of participation in the Son. Without ceasing to be the activity of human beings, the church is enlivened by and is the activity of God. You see, my friends, we are not just a collection of people here. Although we can't divorce the fact that we're all human beings here. 
But instead, we've got to seek to ignite the Holy Spirit and live into what this represents, the activity of God in our world. What Odin is effectively saying is that while we are human beings and part of the gathering or ecclesia, the church, we participate in seeking first the kingdom of God. And as we do that, the church is moved and energized by the Holy Spirit. What we do matters because through our actions, as we pursue God's will, we detonate or ignite the power of God himself through the person of the Holy Spirit. We detonate Holy Spirit dynamite. When we detonate the Holy Spirit through prayer and through action, that fire will spread like you have never seen below before. And I'm going to tell you, folks, folks will come from all over to see a good fire. Right? You want to talk to me about how we fill this church up? We let the Holy Spirit ignite in our midst and we carry that spirit out into our community and when folks see the fire burning here at Bethany, they will want some of what we've got. Let's be that fuse here at Bethany that ignites and fans into flame the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Take a look at this. Got the video, Steve? There we go. of the church matters. All of these things matter in everything that we do here. I'm going to... A lot of times the stuff that I talk about is meant to be edifying and building up the church. Sometimes I like to shove on the church just a little bit. Because if the church isn't shoved just a little bit, then what are we really doing here? Right? Right? Part of that ping has been your support of Mardi Gras. It was amazing to me that by the time I left here last Sunday, everything on the list of things that we need for our homeless outreach in Mardi Gras had already been spoken for. And thank you. Thank you. It's amazing. Uh, I remember when we started talking towards the end of last year about youth group, 
some of the things that we had need. I only spoke with it, I think, in front of the trustees, and like two days later, there was stuff in there that we needed for youth group, which starts tonight. So please keep us in your prayers as we launch into this time. I'm so excited. But I'm going to shove just a little bit on you. Pastor Davies Masigo, I met him. I wish I could have brought the picture that I have of he and I. I met him for the first time at the Special General Conference of the United Methodist Church in St. Louis. That general conference that was dealing with all the stuff that you know we've dealt with for a long time. And Davies and I had already been talking uh, via the internet. We'd done some video calls, things of that nature. And he'd shared with me his ministries. Uh, And I've encountered areas like the places where he serves. And it is heartbreaking. And I remember my first trip to Honduras into the slums of Honduras, the barrio. I went thinking I was going to be this big blessing, right? The, the, the Caucasian mentality. We're going to be a blessing to these who are others, right? And I came away from that trip realizing I had been the one that was blessed. I remember seeing children playing with just a pair of shorts on and no shoes or anything, playing soccer on the dirt streets with a deflated soccer ball because they had no way of getting air into it. And you know what I remember seeing was smiles, happiness, and joy on these kids' faces. They weren't worried about where their next meal was coming from, and that might not have been coming that night. Davy serves in that same kind of area, and he's served there for some time. What I would like to challenge this church with over the next couple of weeks is a giving campaign to support kids going to school. Some of you may know that the way to break the the cycle of poverty is through education, right? If we don't break that cycle of poverty by educating children, they will perpetuate what's going on in their communities in these slums. But when they receive education, they're able to step out into something more. I think most of us have been to school at some level, some at higher levels, some, you know, wherever. Most of these kids without support don't go to school at all. They have to have uniforms. They have to have books. And Pastor Davies Church, which teaches these children, 230 children, these kids receive uniforms, the kids receive their books, the kids receive food that they might not otherwise get. And when I was talking to him about this over the last month or two, I told him I wanted to bring this before the church. It costs $300 to send one child to school for an entire year. What I propose, what I would like to do, is for us to send 10 children to school, $3,000 for a whole year. Um, Is it easy? No. But I ask the question, if we were to be there and to see what's going on there, if we lived in this place that you saw pictures of and Jesus were standing next to us, what would we do if our Lord and Savior was standing right there with his heart broken at the poverty and the sickness and all of the things that we were seeing. What would Jesus do and what would we do? We already know what Jesus would do because we remember the stories of the feeding of the 5,000 and and all of the other miracles that he did when he told the disciples. The disciples said, send them away to eat. Send them away and find something, their own food to eat. And Jesus was like, get out of here. He said, what do we got? Fishes and loaves. We can do something with that. Well, my friends, we can do something about this. And so I would love over the next couple of weeks, if whatever we can put together, I would love to send to Pastor Davies. I would love to send these children to school. I would love to break the cycle of poverty because I think that that's one of the things that we've been called to as a church. 
as we prepare to receive our offerings and God's tithes, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. I thank you for your blessings in our lives. I thank you for what you have done in our hearts. I thank you for your word and helping us to see the plight of our neighbors. And so, Lord, as we are able, as as you have called us out to do, help us to be a blessing to others, even as you have blessed us. Bless the hands that so freely give this day. Bless our families and help us to keep being the men and women of God that you have created us to be. We thank you and we praise you in your son, Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. For those of you worshiping with us online, there's a QR code uh, that you can scan. Uh, It's got a way to give in there. It's got a way to be a participant in the life of this church. Uh, through our newsletters and other means. For those of you worshiping here in person, you know where the offering plates are, and I know many of you give uh, electronically, and thank you for that. Come. here today. I have lived in a life of poverty before. Children that go without have a special place in my heart. It's one of the things that that I will have with me the rest of my days. I love when Steve said he found this video a couple of days after last week, I said, play it, it'll be perfect. And it was more perfect than I thought it would be. We have got to step out and love our neighbors as ourselves, my friends. Jesus did not say, love God and then love our neighbors. He said, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And another commandment is just like it to love our neighbors as ourselves. Jesus' words puts loving God and loving neighbors on the same plane. Not God a little higher than our neighbors. And that's something that we must keep in mind. I love the chance to go see uh, and spend time at House of Neighborly Service uh, just a few days ago and to see the wonderful work they're doing there. And I love the fact that we are, as a church, involved with that. Friends, let's see what we can do. Let's do what God would have us do. Let's sing our way out of here as we think about that. Please stand and join us for our last song. Doxology? You're not going to do a doxology? Change the plans. This song, the last song we're going to sing, um, it comes straight out of uh, Psalm 81. It talks about how we um, can enjoy the wheat um, with honey from the rock, and only he will satisfy us. Um, Pastor Gary, this one's for you. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. Everything I need you got 
there's honey in the rock. It's not hard to see, only you can satisfy, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock, there's honey in the rock. plan power in the blood healing in your hands started flowing when you said it was done everything you did's enough i keep looking i keep finding you keep giving you keep providing i have all that i need you are all that i need you keep praying Praising, you keep proving I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I keep looking, I keep finding, you keep giving, keep providing. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I keep praying, you keep moving. Keep praising, keep proving. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. I have all that I need. You are all that I need. Yeah. There's honey in the rock, water in the stone, manna on the ground, no matter where I go. I don't need to worry now that I know Everything I need you've got There's honey in the rock Purpose in your plan Power in the blood Healing in your hands Started flowing when you said it is done Jesus who you are is enough There's honey in the rock There's honey in the rock There's honey